Hey everyone, welcome to Exploring Health Macro to Micro. I'm your host, Parker Condit. In the show, I interview health and wellness experts around topics like sleep, exercise, nutrition, mental health, stress management, and so much more. By the end of each episode, you'll have concrete, tangible advice that you can start implementing today to start living a healthier life, either for yourself or for your loved ones. And that's the micro side of the show. The macro side of the show is discussing and having conversations around some of these larger systemic issues that are contributing to health outcomes here in the U.S. So an example of that is how health insurance hasn't evolved much and continually rising deductibles and premium costs are just financially squeezing so many people here in this country. And this is something we discussed today, and my guest actually goes over an alternative insurance model as well. My guest today is Cavaliere Franco LaFranco. Franco is a serial entrepreneur, and he co-founded a company in the early 90s that became one of Canada's first high-speed internet companies, and he's since expanded to sports, real estate, and consulting. One of his latest ventures is called Impact Health Sharing, and we discuss this in much more detail throughout the show, but health sharing is essentially a decentralized insurance model. It's a much leaner model, and it provides transparency, which is a very novel concept in the health, in the health insurance industry. Um, there's certainly some healthcare jargon in this episode, like repricing, charge masters, medical loss ratios, but we spend a fair amount of time breaking down these terms so they're easily understood. Um, if you want to get a better understanding of how health insurance works in the U.S. so you can make better decisions for yourself and for your family, this would be a great episode to check out. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Franco LaFranco. Frank Oates, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about healthcare and health insurance today. Uh, normally, two topics that can bore people and put them to sleep, but I think between the two of us, we can keep this very interesting because you have a very unique business that you started. Um, so I think we should just start there, um, and that's going to give our listeners a really good understanding of kind of the different models of health insurance that are out there. Because I think most people just understand: I have Blue Cross, I have Aetna. It just is what it is, but most people probably don't know that there is an alternative. So do you want to start just explaining what your business model is? Sure. I'd be happy to start it and talk about it. First of all, thank you for having me on. Big fan of your show. Love it. The great stuff from the minute I heard it, I go, I love this guy. He's awesome. I love oh, how thanks. authentic and real you are and the value you're bringing to your listeners. So great job, Parker. And excited to be on here. So I'm excited to be, I, it's true, healthcare. Who thinks healthcare is a very exciting topic, but it's a necessary topic, right? Mm. And we're getting to the point where there's more increases coming uh, all the time. Uh, and the part of the problem is, is health insurance companies are really, they're raking it in, record profits. Unfortunately, for most people, uh, costs are going through the roof. 70% of all bankruptcies today in the U.S. are because of health care, mm -hmm. uh, which is sad. 87% of people right now in the U.S. never meet their deductible. That's another way insurance companies make money. Uh, and part of the problem is 5% of Americans are responsible for almost half of all healthcare spending. And so you've got all these dynamics going on. And then the insurance companies want to make money at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so you put that together, you get a recipe for disaster. So I think most people would agree that healthcare is broken. So a lot of the largest companies are self-funding and trying to get away from health insurance companies if they can. And so... Uh, one of them created an incredible technology that we were able to, uh, the name of the company is called Impact Health Sharing. We, it was able to license from them and so that we could commercialize it and launch it to the country. And we're able to launch it in a very powerful way for individuals, family, small businesses. Nine out of 10 small businesses cannot afford to provide health care. They would love to, but they can't, you know, for all the reasons why a small business love to, to help customer uh, employee retention, you know, oh, help sure. them, you know, all that good stuff. And now it's affordable for them. So typically what we're doing right now with our program is we're able to save people uh, 50, sometimes I just say that uh, a gentleman and his family has got four kids, 70% on his uh, monthly health spending every single month. Plus insurance companies have deductibles, right? Mm. Their deductibles are, uh, per family member. So his deductible was about 5,000 per family member. Ours is called a PRA, primary responsibility amount. That's what our, our version is. And it's per household. So he picked a PRA of 2,500 for the whole family. So everybody's contributing to that at the same time. And so it's, 
think about that over a five year period, a 10 year period, 20 year, how much, how much money that could save a, a family or an employee or an individual. And so we're able to lower costs, not just there, but also on the prescription drug part. We're doing really great on that, helping people save money as there. So we're trying to help people every step along the way. It's not just what you're paying every month, which is which will help you save money on, but it's every step along the way to do that. So that's what we're doing right now. We're very excited. We're growing so fast, helping so many families right now. And people, because especially with the economy right now, people need this more than ever. So that's what mm -hmm. we're doing right now. And we're excited to be able to provide this for people. Yeah, that's great. Uh, can you go into, can you explain what a self-funded plan is? Because I think a lot of people don't really understand uh, the difference between a self-funded plan and sort of the the regular card they're carrying around in their pocket. Yeah, so can you explain so, how, how bigger employers will so be So if you've got a company like, a, a good example is uh, UPS, they'll, they'll be self-funded. So large corporations that have a lot of people, they'll typically do that. So they'll try to get away from the insurance company, self-funded. So literally what it means, self-funded, they self-fund themselves. Uh, and provide the underlying guarantees for that themselves. And, but, you know, it also requires heavy duty technology to be able to do that and a whole interesting back end. That's what we've got. We've got six patents right now. I think three patents, three patents pending on the technology. Um, so we're, we're, it's, we're one of a kind, very unique, very excited about that. We've, we've even improved what some of these companies are doing. And so out of that, we're able to provide that. And because of that, when you're when you're you are in that in that modality for example if you're a health insurance company they require you to be in network and if you're out of network then what happens to your deductible oh it increases or not even available with us there is no network that's the beauty of the model you can go to any place in in the country where you where like because imagine you're a truck driver and you have health care and you get hurt you're in montana and you get hurt in california oh now you're not covered or your deductible is double. Like, how does that even make any sense, right? But that's how most people have to deal with it. And so we're, we're, part of one of the benefits we bring is you can pick any doctor or hospital, no referrals necessary. And one of the cool features we offer, which I love, I love using it, is we have something called MD Live or telehealth. It's included. So I give an example. I went from uh, Aetna paying 600 a month to with us 150 a month and included in that is free telehealth is included. So I wasn't feeling very well. I just get a video call with a doctor just like that. And, and I can pick my doctor. There's a bunch of them become available. I, I type in my symptoms. When you log into your own portal, you have your own portal, you log in and then all the doctors are available in the next hour or two. And you can do a video call with them. You can do a telephone call with them. They can diagnose you. They can send you prescription drugs. Do whatever you want. And it's so really cool. So imagine you're a truck driver back to my original point. And now you're not feeling well. Well, where do you go? Well, you can get on your video call from your truck, for his example, mm -hmm. and type in and do a video call right from there. Hey, what do I need? And then they can send a prescription right to a pharmacy right near where you're at yep. in the truck. Now that's cool, right? That's like, that's the whole point of taking advantage of technology. And that's kind of like how it works. Yeah, it, it sounds like a really good example of utilizing technology to address some of the social determinants of health, which is just a, a big thing right now. It's like seeing how we can make healthcare more equitable across across many aspects, right? It's not just who's the doctor you're seeing, but it's it's access, it's cost, it's the environment that you're living in. So the idea of including telehealth, I think, is really uh, forward thinking. And also through the pandemic, it was interesting. Like not a lot of great things came out of the pandemic, but one of the things that was really positive was the fact that the healthcare industry, which is generally very slow to change and very slow to evolve, adopted telehealth in about three weeks across the country. So we're like, yeah. okay, we saw that the country can do it, right? When it's necessary, we can do it. Um, so that that was a very promising thing. And just the ability to provide access to people without having, because transportation is an issue in a lot of areas. So the sort of low cost access to care is, I think, a very a very necessary thing for starting to address social determinants. And, and one of the things of we learned from, many. yeah, one of the things we learned in the pandemic, not everybody wants to go to a doctor's office. You know, sure. I, if I don't want to go, why should I have to go if I don't want to? Why can't I do it from home? Why do I have mm -hmm. to actually physically go in? What's wrong with video? Like, with uh, like, you know, what are they going to check? Really? So one of the cool things that the pandemic, that's one of the other positives that came out is, hey, we could do some stuff over video, just like we're doing this podcast right now. You know, this exploded, this whole medium exploded during the pandemic. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's going to keep a lot of people healthier because, you know, uh, people that are high risk going into an office where there's other sick people, like that's where transmission happens. So if you're right, if you don't necessarily need to be there, I think providing access and care remotely when necessary 
is a great option. Um, and obviously it's not a brand new technology. This was around before the pandemic, but a lot of people just need to be, or a lot of industries just need to be forced into action as was the case three years ago. Um, can you explain a little bit about what repricing is? Um, because so you can obviously get the, 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 the prices you offer for health insurance obviously have to be negotiated somehow on the other end, like the prices that you're going to end up paying the providers. So can you explain what repricing is? Yeah, that's an interesting topic because I, I'm sure most people are familiar with you go to get a bill from a hospital doctor or clinic and they're like, oh, like sticker shock. Like, what is this? Right. Yeah. And then some people get the cash price, which is about 50% off. Then there's two other prices. There's the reprice price. And then there's the price uh, insurance companies pay. So for example, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, any of these big insurance companies, what they'll do is they'll uh, do a pre-negotiated price for all these amounts, right? No problem. The problem is they're constantly putting pressure on these hospitals and doctors to lower those prices and lower those prices to the point where some people now will not accept certain insurance companies. In fact, if you go to an insurance company right now, they may say on your policy, by the way, what's in network today may not be in network three months from now because they're constantly... Uh, in battle with these doctors and hospitals. So what you thought was a network now, six months or now, may no, no longer be a network for you. And so then there's repricing. What is repricing? So there's a base reference pricing and we have a, an incredible uh, firm that helps us nationwide do this. And it's more than what insurance comes. So doctors and hospitals love us. That's why we pay on average between 10 and 20 business days, which is one of the fastest in the entire country. Uh, we quickly go through the bills. We know what it should be. Uh, we have an incredible success rate of doing that. We reprice on average right now between, let's say, 70 and 75%, which doctors and hospitals, they they get it. They're fine with it. They get what that's what the pricing is, and no big deal. And so that's why a lot of them are happy to have be accept, accepting us and our members uh, to do that. So it's a very it's a very important thing when you do uh, repricing because it's it's a necessary evil that we have to go through when you go to the hospital or doctor or whatever you need and so we have a full-time people that's that are doing that on our behalf so you don't have to worry about it our members don't have to worry about it it's all done for you and uh it's an and doctors and hospitals also like it because we're not trying to you know bottom feed them so to speak like insurance companies would like to do because you know they also want to get paid and i get it i have one doctor working with he's retired he's been retired for 18 months he's still waiting to get paid on claims from 18 months ago past to maybe two years ago that the, the insurance company has not even paid him and i don't know if you saw there's a big uh a big uh stink from cigna from a uh, big article that came out with them in march now they got caught obviously there's probably more companies doing this i uh, can't prove it yet but i'm sure there is so cigna told their doctors hey when these claims come in ignore them so 300,000 claims just got totally ignored. So the doctor spent on average, because they can check, 1.2 seconds per claim <laughs> reviewing it. <laughs> I, I'm not a claims adjuster, but that doesn't seem like enough time. <laughs> so wh why? Because look, what do insurance companies want to do? They take all your money in, and they want to, they buy companies, they do all kinds of stuff with your money, because you don't know where your money goes when it goes in. So it's actually a really cool way to talk about our technology and how our tech works. So. When you pay each month, so for example, I pay $150 per month. So that goes into my virtual wallet. So anybody of, uh, familiar with crypto understands this. That's why young people love our product because they get it. It makes so, sense to them, yeah. Yeah, your money goes into a virtual wallet. Now let's say you needed, you know, God forbid something should happen to you. Mm -hmm. The AI that we have knows exactly how much you take from each member to pay for you. That's how it works. It's amazing. So the money just sits there until it's needed. It doesn't go to somebody's pocketbook for profits. It doesn't go to some executive CEO that's making $300 million. It doesn't go to any of that. It just goes when somebody needs the money and it's fully transparent. You get your own portal. You can see it. My, your money, you'll always have money in your account. How the AI is trained and what it knows to do, it must always leave money in people's accounts until it's needed. That's kind of how it works. That's pretty awesome. Transparency in healthcare. What a novel idea. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, but it's funny. Some people go with a shock, but they say like, oh, this is, this is amazing. This is real. This is, oh my God. Why does everybody do this way? Cause then you can't make money. Right. I, I'm going to want to come back to repricing because I, I think people don't appreciate how hilariously high charge master prices are. But, uh, since we kind of got there already, can you talk about medical loss ratio? Because that's essentially what you're talking about. The difference between established, um, 
health insurance companies and then kind of what you're doing where the money just stays uh, sort of in this decentralized area is what you're talking about. And then in regular health insurance companies, uh, they have, they've been required to pay out a certain amount of premium money uh, in claims. And then the rest is just used for profit, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. But that sort of model leads, if, if your pie is fixed as far as what you can make in profit, the only way to increase profits is to make the pie bigger, which leads to these weird incentives. So if you can share any more about medical loss ratio, I think that's yeah, helpful. That's a great point, Parker. So uh, look, and I grew up in Canada. So Canada is a little bit different because um, for us, I remember when I moved to the U.S., I was in shock. I got to pay how much for health care? And I got to, there's a deductible and then there's copay and co-share. What is all the, what is it, prescription drugs or how much? Like I was literally in shock when I moved from Canada to the United States. Sure. I couldn't believe it. And then I started studying the industry. I'm like, wow, this is quite the little racket going on over here. I see how this is works. This is quite interesting. It's actually, I was kind of like impressed. This is actually a little bit genius-like. And so, and then every once in a while, you know, these companies will, raise deductibles why because if you're not meeting your deductible it's more profit for them right because when mm -hmm. you're paying money into them to your point it's a centralized system it goes into a centralized fund which is them and then they dictate they've got you right certain measures have to go through the, through paying premiums but after that or through claims after that what they do with it is up to them so what they're doing they're buying companies they're doing this they're doing all these other things it goes to profit shareholders buying back stock all these other things that have nothing to do with your money nothing but to make them more profitable and so for us okay that's an interesting model but it doesn't help people it doesn't help companies save money it doesn't help companies uh, be able to retain their employees so they can take that savings and then hire more employees so for us it's like to, for us healthcare is a tool for you to be more profitable for you to save money put more money in your pocket that's what healthcare should be for and provide you great care and great care because look it's great to cut costs but you don't want to also cut care so what we want to do is save you money but also provide better care at the same time and that's really what we do so to your point yeah companies are doing health health insurance they, they had record profits last year for a reason so to your point our model is decentralized everybody has their own virtual wallet fully transparent you can see exactly where every one of your dollar goes as it should be in the healthcare space this is healthcare it's not selling you a car you know, I'm not saying this is for your own well-being. That's what to me that never made sense to me. Here we are taking people's lives, people going bankrupt, people like it's. I can't imagine. I'll tell you a great example. I had a dad, and he has uh, he had uh, five kids, four kids. He had four kids, paying twenty five, twenty six hundred dollars a month for him, his wife, and his four kids, and he couldn't afford it anymore. And he's about to sell his car. He's going to sell his car. I go. And I'm talking to him. I go, how are you going to get to work? <laughs> he goes, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I just got to do it because otherwise I can't leave my kids without health care. He started to cry, literally started to cry because of, he goes, I don't have to sell my car now. I go, I know there's no need. But see, to me, it's those stories that get me excited and motivated to do this because there's so many people suffering out there. There's 30 million people in the U.S. that have nothing. Either they get they can't because they're they make too much money for state aid or or any kind of aid or not enough to pay for health insurance. Well, what are these? I can't imagine being someone one of these people that must be terrified every day. Don't get into an accident, don't do anything, don't get right. sick. Like, how do you live like that? Yep. You know, it's sad. I like I, I don't think there's another industry in this country that makes people make more tough decisions than the healthcare industry. Exactly to the point you were saying. It's like, do I sell my car or do I keep my family covered? with health insurance it's it's just this never-ending string of impossible situations you hear it with uh premiums hospital bills medications um it, it it just seems like there's no other industry that's even close to putting people in those types of financial situations well the problem is when you look there's some industries that well, even education for example well, you know look, look at what tuitions are out for for sure. universities it's ridiculous colleges it's unbelievable it's higher than anywhere else in the world. Whenever you introduce the profit motive into something that I think is essential to a community or society to get better, smarter, wiser, uh, help improve society in a general way, and you put profit into that, it's never a good thing in my opinion. So yeah. to me, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a big time capitalist. I believe in capitalism, but 
I, I'm cool if we find a way to take care of people for healthcare and education and then let people go crazy and do whatever they got to do to become successful in life. But when you're, to your point, when you're putting that kind of pressure and stress on families, it's tough. Like I, I couldn't imagine, you know, having children, little kids and not being able to provide for them, being terrified when they go to school, oh my God, are they going to be covered? Are they not going to be covered? Or what are we going to do? Um, are they going to be okay? What if something little Johnny breaks his leg? Oh, how are we going to pay for this? They're ba uh, barely paying their mortgage or their rent right now. Mm -hmm. Like and all the, and then the inflation is hitting now on top of that with the new rate increases. Come, I mean, it's just unbelievable. So for me, you know, the way I, I look at life and business is what can we do to help those, those families? What can we do to help alleviate them? Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that drive our economy. They're the backbone of what we're doing. They're the hardworking families that we really need to make a healthy society. So I'm with you, Andrew. Yeah, no, it, you brought up a really interesting point, which is uh, kind of like the very capitalistic nature of the healthcare industry. And like, I look at what these companies are doing. I'm like, they're doing exactly what they should be doing in a capitalistic Correct. environment. Like they're, they're maximizing profit for their shareholders. They're doing a great job at their job. Um, unfortunately, it just doesn't align with like the healthcare needs of our country. That's where you get these misaligned uh, incentives. It's but. true. You can't even, you can't even blame them. They're just doing no. what they're supposed to be. Doing. I'd be doing the same thing. Probably if I was the CEO of that company, who I'd right, probably think about the same thing. That's my that's job. That's the job. Yeah, exactly. And they're doing a great job at it. Um, yeah. So it, it's hard to be mad at them for that perspective. It's like, that's why you need to look at it very systemically. It's like, how do we, how do we not just create a better health insurance company? If you're trying to do that, you're just going to, you know, you're going to create something that's competing with Blue Cross and Aetna. You need to think totally differently which is why this decentralized model that you're talking about is so interesting. Yeah, it's, and that's what te where technology comes in. It reminds me of when Uber launched. I remember when Uber launched and the whole taxi cab industry went bananas, like losing their mind. Yeah. How could you be a third of our price, you know? And, oh, your car is cleaner and it smells nicer. What's, what's going on here? How is this possible? And it was like weird, right? When you first got the app, I'm getting into somebody's car and they're driving me somewhere. This is so strange. Mm -hmm. But the power of technology to connect us is kind of like what it does, right? Like imagine when Airbnb launched, right? Imagine when the iPhone launched and someone told you, hey, Parker, guess what? There's a phone going to come out. I just watched the movie Blackberry, which is kind of interesting. So I'm originally from Canada. So it was fu funny because I grew up like 30 minutes from where Blackberry was, the head oh, office. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So for me, it was a fascinating movie. And, but, but uh, imagine when they saw this, this new phone comes out and it's going to have apps. What's an app? And from right. this app, Imagine you can click something and a car will come get you and drive you wherever you want to go. And you can order food from wherever you want and it'll bring it right to you. Like if you told somebody when you saw when, when that phone with no keyboard, could understand anything, they'd be like, well, how's this pot? They'd be like mind boggling to more people, to a lot of people. So to, we're kind of liking that boat right now with how we've created a decentralized model for healthcare. But you'll see, I believe this, this type of model will catch on over the next three, four or five years. Uh, and hopefully who knows, maybe it'll become the standard model for how we deliver healthcare in this country. How easy is like this model to replicate? Cause like I, just based on our, so we spoke before this call. So I have a decent understanding of your sort of entrepreneurial background. So I know, I already know that you have the, you have the mind for this, but like how easy is it for other organizations to sort of replicate something like this? Well, the cool thing is I have nothing to do with building it and creating it. That's the good okay. news. There's a lot smarter people than me that are doing that. Thank God. Okay. That's the good news. How would you replicate it? Well, you would need an, an AI that would know how to do it, but you need also ex people experienced in the industry that understand what the pricing should be, uh, how you price it, what the, our primary responsibility amount should be. So there's different things, what the co-share should be setting up the financial systems in place, the protocols in, space, in, in place. Like if you go to our YouTube channel at impacttelsharing.com, there's a great video that the CEO of the company, Mr. Phil Chrysler, talks about called the protocols. And it'll, he goes in into great detail. It's a great video that talks about the, pro, the protocols behind, the pillars behind impact and what's necessary. And so it's not easy to do, that's for sure. Can it be done 100%? It's like everything else. Like, you know, when Uber came out, Lyft came out after to compete, mm -hmm. you're always going to have your company. You have these other little guys that compete against it. The one called Fair, I think it was. So you have all these little guys that come out afterwards, but it can be done. Uh, and then you also need the money behind it to make sure it's solid and the company's safe and all that good stuff. Okay. So it it's not something somebody's going to start in the garage next week, but uh, uh, it, it, it is no. also possible to, to Well, replicate. and it's also people's healthcare. Like, we got to be smart here. Like, it's like, mm -hmm. this is not... 
I'm se- I'm selling you widgets, you know, and like yeah, yeah. you could return the widget, you know. We got to make sure that that the system works. Hospitals and doctors are excited to take our product. Like when I go to the doctor or hospital, I bring my card. Here's my card. I just bring it to, to them, and mm-hmm. we're on the same. We paid a lot of money to be in the same network billing system as all the major insurance companies. So sure. just got to pop in the number. We pop right up. It's very smart. So. Are, are there any other parts of the healthcare industry that you see sort of like ripe for innovation? Because it, it just seems like such an inefficient industry. So I see that and I go, well, there's plenty of opportunities. Are there any that are really jumping out to you? Well, if I look up the prescription drug pricing model, that's a big one. So you got guys like Mark Cuban out there doing good yep. stuff. You got GoodRx doing good stuff out there, trying to do different things. There's a lot of good companies coming out now trying to, uh, the problem is, is when these new drugs come out and, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies just abuse they're charging a gazillion dollars per mm-hmm. or a thousand times, whatever the price is. And obviously I'm exaggerating, but in some cases I'm not. What their cost of the drug is to, so they can make them a, a lot of money back. And so that's a, another great industry that we can see in the future, different ways of drug delivery. I think we will need a revised FDA to be able to do that and how we create drugs. That's going to be a, a, a big pride. I know you've talked about that before. Um, on your show, but that's mm-hmm. kind of like what we have to look at. That's going to be, that's, that's one big sector. The other sector is, um, you know, hospitals and doctors and how they bill and how they structure that. And that's another way of, of looking at different pricing models and different deliveries. And, um, you know, it's not easy because whenever you've got, you've got the, the, the people that c- deliver the service, right? The doctors, the hospitals, then you've got the clients. How do you match them up? It's how you make that efficient. So when you've got an insurance company in the middle, taking a big chunk of that money, then that delivers naturally inefficiency in the system. Mm. So the the game is how do you connect the two, but efficiently? In Canada, the government decided to do it. So the government could connect you right through a centralized system, government system. The negative of that is it's overwhelming for them. Uh, it's not always the best healthcare. A lot of those doctors leave because they don't feel like they're being represented properly or compensated properly. So there's inefficiencies in that system because you have government involved that doesn't does not really great at doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's not really their place. Mm-hmm. So that so maybe there's a way like we're doing it, and other technologies can come around and have technology be the source of it. With AI, I have a lot of faith in AI. I don't. A lot of people are scared of AI. I'm not. I think AI could be a real solution for a lot of this stuff when applied in the right way. Yeah, you mentioned a few really interesting things there. Uh, One of them was talking about the Canadian system and just the fact that it's like a single payer system coming from the government. Um, Yeah, a lot of people who don't know a lot about healthcare, they'll say, oh, we just need a single payer system. And it's like, have you heard the expression, money only solves money problems? (laughs) Yeah. So like single single payer system only solves uh, single payer problems, right? Which we certainly have plenty of in this country, but it, like you said, it leads to its own set of issues as well. So that's not like a, it's just a blanket statement that doesn't, it doesn't solve a wide swath of problems. And the Um, other problem, the other problem is also as people getting older, it's really puts more of a strain on the system itself from government for the thing. So it, it, like, how can we is also, is there a way we can create a better system, maybe use technology for that? Because remember right now, 5% of people responsible for almost half of all healthcare costs. That's a sure. problem. Maybe government can find a way to efficiently, efficiently deliver that in a way. That's why I'd be looking right now. Because if you think about what is the low hanging fruit here, that's the low hanging fruit. That's half of all costs. So how can we help that 5% reduce their costs? What can we do? And then by the way, if we can help that 5%, then that's less burden on the insurance company. Then maybe they can still make their money if you still want to keep insurance companies around and have them, but then lower their costs and therefore increase their profitability. And then maybe they can spread that savings across everybody else. Yeah. One of the other interesting things that you brought up kind of dovetailing off that point is the idea that the the more intermediaries you add, uh, the the less efficient it becomes, the higher the cost is going to be. And I've never seen the industry, like learning this industry is so challenging because you you think you know the players, right? You have payers, providers, and patients. And then in the middle of that, be like, oh, well, there's also a pharmacy benefit managers. And that was kind of to your point, talking about the cost of prescription drugs and how that's very obfuscated. And then you just start looking at all these different industries or verticals within the industry. And you're just seeing be like, oh, there's so many middlemen. There's so many intermediaries. You're like, this is why it's so slow and inefficient. So I, I think you make a great point of, 
trying to streamline the connection between patient and provider, right? Like how many steps do there really need to be between the two of them? And I think we have way too many. That's the game. That's really, honestly, if you look at the next decade, that should be what we should be looking at. And how can AI help that? Uh, where we found a way, one way where AI can absolutely do that and help people save a ton of money. But that should be the way. How can AI help us streamline those two things, connecting them together? Hey, people, they, if you're not going to take insurance companies out, cool. How can we streamline that as well and help them as well? Because a lot of these, these insurance companies, the problem with them is they have these old legacy systems that are like, if they wanted to be us, they couldn't. Like it would take them mm -hmm. five years, 10 years to, if they want to try to be us just because they've got all this inherent uh, old architecture and infrastructure in place that they could not be us even if they wanted to right now. I mean, that's kind of true across the industry, right? I mean, the the hassle of getting uh, hospitals and, and providers to move from paper records to EHRs, you know, that's a government stimulus, 15 years, and it's still not going well. Um, the, the idea of interoperability, the ability to share patient data between two providers, that was the whole point of this. And it's still a nightmare. Um, so, <laughs> well... <laughs> Never mind. I just, I just remember when when the Obama administration was launching the website and what that took to launch a simple site and oh, complicated. Yeah, it's yeah, too funny. I just that rollout that. wasn't great. Um, no, it's just it, yeah, so it's you, funny. I, it just seems like to me the healthcare industry has more fraught with these disasters than almost every other industry. Yeah, and you know, just another example of. Uh, what happens when government tries to run things. And I'm not saying like that's not a long-term solution, but it's just, it's it's not the panacea that I think a lot of people talk about it to be. Well, if you look at what people are paying today, absolutely it's not. I mean, it's, it, it, I think it, I, we can all agree today it's failed on what was original mandate to make affordable healthcare available to all. And every year that goes by, we get further and further away from that. And so we need to fix it. It's a broken system and whatever we can do to fix it, we have to do that because people are suffering. And we have to help those people. Yeah, that's a great point. I want to go back to uh, price and transparency because uh, one, I think that it, it's hard for people to just throw their money into a pot and be like, well, hopefully I get my return at some point, which is the normal system, uh, the normal health insurance system where like, hopefully I get covered when I need to. So I, I think the fact that you're sort of providing this like almost blockchain-esque uh, transparency of like seeing where the money is every step of the way. That's very smart. Um, just because I want to go back to uh, charge master pricing for a second. The way repricing works is if a hospital knows that they're going to have to give a 70% discount or 60% discount to a large insurance carrier, they're not starting with like a realistic number. That's why, like, if you, because so the uh, many hospitals, they have to list prices for like the 500, 500 most common procedures now. So most hospitals you should be able to go to, and um, this is just another thing that's not policed very well, but you should be able to like get prices from regular procedures, but you'll see things. So uh, this was from a few years ago, but Stanford hospital was charging uh, $500, $450 for a comprehensive metabolic panel. And that was the cash pay price. So that was discounted from $1,100 for a comprehensive metabolic panel, which you can get for $20. So I just wanted to highlight, <laughs> just like, you're just kind of making up numbers where there's not even a reasonable sniff test because um, because there's been there's been no tra uh, price transparency for so long. Like you couldn't, you couldn't put a $200,000 sticker on like a, a Toyota Camry. It just wouldn't, nobody would, it wouldn't, it wouldn't pass the sniff test for anyone just because we have enough transparency in that market. Um, but do you see any, do you see a larger shift coming towards transparency within the industry? Well, let's, so I, I'll give you, I'll give you some, we've got, I mean, we've, we've done, you know, thousands and thousands of claims. I'll tell you some of the funny ones we've seen. We did, we took one from, um, 3,000 to $288. We took one from 152,000 to 36,000. You know, we have all these like claims that it's kind of funny. So. Look, I think transparency is something people are yearning for in general today. I just think we're symptomatic of what people want, whether it's through a podcast like this, a communication. People are seeking authenticity. People want transparency from politicians, from people, from teachers, from family. I just think it's something that we're yearning for more than ever. And I just think we're, we're just a result of what people are looking for. Otherwise, otherwise we wouldn't be successful, right? 
people want transparency. People want to see and be empowered by where is their money going? What's it being set, spent on? Well, oh, show me, let me see it. So with us, they can literally um, uh, log into their portal and they can see every single penny where it goes, every single month that the money goes in. And if the money is not needed, it sits in your portal. And if you left, by the way, you take that money with you <laughs> because it's your money. It does not belong to us. It belongs to the individual member. And that's our whole approach. And that's transparency. And that's decentralization. And I think you'll see in the future, financial institutions moving that way. I think you're going to see a whole, uh, a whole different sectors moving to a decentralized model where people are empowered because it's their money, it's their accounts, and they should be able to do what, and they can monitor. And it's going to hold a lot of companies more accountable for individual people's money. And I think people are going to start getting used to this and clamoring for it. And you're going to see, and with AI, it's going to be definitely doable over the next decade. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Uh, people are certainly clamoring for transparency and it would just help because so one of the interesting things is that how many people avoid treatment because they don't know how much it's going to cost. They're worrying is, I think it's like 40% of people in a given year will delay or avoid treatment because they don't know how much it's going to cost. Um, if you, and a lot of these things, because they're just operating largely with made up numbers, uh, they, they do look artificially high. Um, and then maybe if they even did have insurance, they're, they're still not sure what the cost is going to be. So they end up delaying treatment and that costs the system and the aggregate significantly more in the long run because symptoms get worse, treatment gets, um, more expensive as you have to go along. So yeah, I think you're totally right that people are dying for, <laughs> dying for uh, some transparency. And, and I think it's symptomatic, Parker, to the whole, end, to everything, uh, all of society today, you know, for the longest time, there was no transparency in anything like corporations could do whatever they wanted. Governments can do whatever they want. And now with technology, with social media, uh, you know, we, we're, we're more, we're scrutinizing more, right? We're more uh, skeptical about everything. And so I think transparency now, I think companies that can issue in whatever way they can transparency to their client base, to their members and to their employees in general, I think they're the ones that in the next decade, I believe will win. And those that don't, I believe will fall behind. And because I, I think it's just what people are looking for today. So those that are, I, I, and you can see it happening in so many different industries. Mm -hmm. And so those that embrace that, I think over the next decade, are going to really rock and roll uh, with uh, with uh, the size and growth of their companies. Yeah, because like there's so much more choice now and people are just gravitating towards the the companies and the organizations that they feel like they have a kinship towards. And the author, like there's just so much uh, media out there now. Like you can't really hide behind like cor corporate messaging anymore. Like you need to be authentic as a company to sort of draw those people towards you. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. That's why I'm excited. I'm, I'm optimistic because I just think, you know, growing up, I've always believed this. I go, you know, technology, uh, used the right way can always help better society. And so I'm excited about the possibilities that that AI can bring and that new technology can bring and transparency especially can bring. So I think there's two things happening at the same time. We've got a level of social consciousness, uh, awareness happening. Uh, probably faster than maybe every any other time in our history. At the same time, we have technology coming. Now we have to be careful, you know, that this one doesn't go, the technology doesn't supersede uh, how fast our consciousness can accept that technology because that, 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 that's what can destroy societies and cultures. Mm -hmm. But I, I, think if, I think if we can manage that, I think we're going to be in for a really incredible next decade or two. Yeah, so I'd love to kind of move on to one of the common questions I ask people, which is like, if you were a ruler for the day, and you could just sort of implement any policy or change in this country to improve at the aggregate level, like population health, what would you try to do? Uh, the answer may not be different. I, I would do a 10% flat tax fee on everybody. That's all I would do. And the reason why I would do that is because a lot of times, a lot of these big corporations pay nothing and that money could be coming into the pool to mm -hmm. helping more people. And so for me, look, companies and rich people will always find a way around loopholes because that's what they do. Sure. And they'll that's, lobby for that. That's, that's the why game. these accounting firms are so big. Yeah. Right? That's why these lawyers make so much money. That's their job. Um, and so the key to me would be, uh, can we just make everybody just pay 10%? I don't care. Because like if the corporate rate today is in the 20s, okay, let's just say, well, they're not, most of the, the smart companies will never pay that. 
they will never pay that. And they'll right. find a way. Look at Apple. Totally, everything's offshore. Like, yeah. eh, everything's out. So just like, you pay this. And then if it's 10%, they don't care. It's not worth the headache to do all those things to go around it. And so I believe that will cause a big boom in government coffers. Individuals will be paying, the ones that don't. I just think it's a totally doable number. And you're going to see a big boom in income to government, people being proud to pay that amount. And then that money can make a big difference, maybe to pay for healthcare, maybe to pay for education, maybe to provide all that stuff at the same time while helping lower income for our taxes for other people. And then having other people that never pay be okay with paying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you brought up a really good point, which is sort of like the closed loop system of like rich companies paying other rich companies to yeah. help them avoid paying taxes. Like if some of that money just went back into the aggregate pool, it'd probably be pretty beneficial to society, but it kind of just stays in like the, you know, the, the EYs and the, you know, the, the consulting firms of or the accountancy firms of the world. Yeah. And I've seen a bunch of, now look, it may put a lot of accounting firms out of business because it's so simple than to do accounting, right? Cause there's no loopholes. There's no tax credit. No, this, uh, that's just 10%. And I've seen a lot of studies that would show how so many companies would then say, yeah, I'll pay the 10% now. It's not worth it for me to bypass that or to go around that or to avoid that or to bring it down to 2% or 5% or, or move the whole company to go here or go do that. It's not worth it to them anymore. Right. And so there'd be so much more money, I believe, coming into the system. And, and then it would create an incredible culture of people just proud to support each other and help each other and say, oh, yeah, I pay my 10%. By the way, what's tithing normally biblically? What's it always been? 10%. It's for a reason it's 10%. It's an interesting number that goes back thousands of years. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting perspective. Do you, do you think growing up in Canada gave you a different perspective now coming here and operating in the in the US space? I think so. Uh, I mean, given I can see like education is so much less expensive there and it's still great quality. Um, healthcare, same thing, because it comes out of our taxes. I mean, obviously there's things that don't work great about either of them, but I think what it's, sh it's shown me is because we didn't have the stress of it there. That's the difference. So, okay. Then it wasn't the greatest healthcare, but there was no stress around it. Mm. Remember when I first came to the US, the stressor, I got to pay how much every month? And there's this right. thing called a deductible and, and I could afford it. So it's fine for me. And then I think, but how many people cannot? And what's that stress putting on a family? So to me, it really have like what can i do how can i get involved how can i help this because uh i know what that feeling's like and i can't imagine family like i and i've talked about this obviously at nausea about this podcast but it really is it's a horrible feeling to be a family or a parent and not being able to take care of your family even yourself like I mean, you're driving around i have no health care something happens oh well you know <laughs> but this is why 70 percent of the bankruptcies are because of health care because yeah, they're, they're like what can i do i have nothing yeah, so that's, I mean, that's where it's shifting me. And then one thing that's interesting about Canada and the U.S., I know it's a difference. I'm not, I'm not making a judgment about whether this is right or wrong. I notice in Canada, we primarily say things like, um, we have to help each other. We have to do this. We have to do that. It's mostly we. It's a little, very different. Versus in the U.S., it's, it's my rights. It's my stuff. It's my mm -hmm. this. It's my that. More for individual rights. And that's okay. Like, it's not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they have unintended consequences for each one. So in Canada, you'll, you'll tend more towards socialism real to, because you speak that way. Cause I believe speaking gives you the reality of which you live in. And so if you, if you're always speaking in we, we, this, us, then you're going to be creating policies that reflect that. But whereas if you're talking about, this is my house, this is my rights, this is my, then you'll be taking, uh, creating policies that reflect the individual. And that's what we see happening, uh, consistently across the board. And there's pros and cons to both. So what I what you can clearly see, live having lived in both, is the dichotomy of each, which is really interesting to see. And like gun rights and this and that, all different things that come aboard. So I'm not making a judgment around it. I'm just saying there's consequences of the speaking of how we talk and what we say and what we create. I think that's a very underrated point that you just made. The I mean, like largely in like the self help groups. Uh, uh, circles of the world, the, uh, you know, understanding your belief system and the words you speak to yourself and out loud are incredibly powerful. But I think it's a great point from a societal standpoint, speaking about the, the general collective we, that is probably more common in Canada versus the more me or I that you experience here. That's really interesting. Not the answer yeah. I would have expected. And it was really, I remember when I first moved here, I was like, 
wow, it's really, you really notice it, it's pronounced. And it was interesting at first, you get used to it eventually. Then you get used to playing, you know, going, then because both can be annoying and both can be great. Like sure. they both have the positives and negatives. Like I go back to Ken, I'm like, can you not think for yourself, man? Think for yeah. yourself, right? Why is everybody got to be about us and we? And like, and then you come down here and it goes, guys, think about everybody else around. Like, so you get like, you get to see both sides. It's really interesting. And both yeah. can drive you crazy and both are, both can be powerful. Like I said, no perfect, uh, no perfect solution. No, no, there's not a perfect solution. It's just, so I've always, not, what, what it's made me think though, is what is a solution that can satisfy both? Is there a way? It actually has trained me to think that way versus one or the other. Because a lot of times when you're in it, you don't realize you're doing it. Because mm -hmm. if you're born into it, you don't see that you're doing it. Versus when you can go outside of both, you see it happening. And you say, okay, this is how this speaks. This is how this speaks. What, what, what can we create to satisfy both ways? Yeah, no, I think it's a great mentality to take. It's uh, just forcing you to open up to different perspectives. Probably be very beneficial, I would assume. I guess uh, one of the last things I want to wrap up with is going to be, if you couldn't be doing what you're doing today, what is another field or profession you could see yourself kind of taking on professionally? If I could do anything, I could, whatever skill I wanted, I would be the general manager of an NFL football team. Oh, interesting. <laughs> that's what I would do. <laughs> that's what I would do. Uh, not today, obviously, because it's like, it's a lot of training and a lot of stuff, but that just seems like so much fun to me where you can build a team and get players and sign players and recruit and all that stuff. It just seems like fun to me. So that, that or own a team. Uh, I don't know if I ever, one day I'll ever make enough money to own one. It'd be kind of fun, but to be the general manager of one would be so fun. That or a professional soccer team would be really fun. My dad was, uh, my dad used to own a professional soccer team in Canada. Oh, wow. And so I used to like go to the games and watch and learn and how he would run the team and operate it. And it was really, I ended up playing for the team eventually. So it was kind of fun. So, um, it was really, and then he had me doing all the odd jobs, like being the, being the announcer at the game, mm -hmm. uh, cleaning up like towel boy when I was a kid. So I got to see all aspects of owning a professional team, which is kind of fun, but he was also the general manager, I guess, because he's my dad, I, he is my hero. So I always admired that. So to be a that of a big professional team, be kind of a cool thing to be able to achieve. Very interesting. Uh, a whole nother side to you that I did not know about. Um, I was going to ask, did you play sports growing up? But it sounds like you played soccer. Did you play? Anything I played. Else? Yeah, I, I played a little football. Uh, I played a little soccer. I played some hockey, uh, ball hockey. I played a bunch of play, play ping pong, tennis. I, I, I love play. I love sports in general. It's just so fun. I had always a great time playing all sports. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I was, yeah, the sports thing threw me off. That's really interesting. You had <laughs> Sorry. To, I, no, like, no, 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 it's, it's great. Do you have like an NFL team that you're a big fan of? Here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I grew up in Toronto, so the closest team to us was the Buffalo Bills. Okay. So that's who okay. I grew up watching as a kid, right? And I remember they were the ones I would watch. And, uh, I, you know, I went through the four Super Bowl losses, you know, getting depressed as they lost each, each and every year. Yep. And now I'm excited because they're getting better, which is kind of cool. But every year they seem to have one heartbreaking loss after another. It's like, you know, I, I look at the Buffalo Bills as a team that builds your character. Because if you can survive, survive them being a fan of their team, you can survive anything. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really interesting. Like the... The Buffalo Bills, they sort of take on, now we're just talking about sports. Uh, they just, uh, they really take on the mentality of sort of the city. And Buffalo is like a very like blue collar, tough, but like loving in like that New Yorkish sort of way. Yeah. Uh, Buffalo is a really interesting city, but I love that that city, I love that they haven't moved the team out of that city. Yeah. I think it's a big, it's a, it's a win. That's a win. It's a success story. I think it's a great thing that you can have a small town and be that successful in a sport because of the way they do the revenue sharing. The NFL is the one thing the NFL has done really great in doing revenue sharing. And it's, mm -hmm. Buffalo's a great town, great people. Uh, I've been there so many times, being having so close to it, gone to a bunch of games, so fun. Um, not crazy about the snow. That's why I left, moved to Arizona. Makes but, sense. Uh, but uh, love, love the town, love the people. And it's funny when, when wherever, I see a lot of Buffalo Bills fans down here. And some of them have their license plate or like my wife's doctor is a big Buffalo Bills fan. So we have a lot to share. It's really fun. So it's really cool when we, when we get to, and all NFL teams have that. Like they have that kindred. Like on my street, I have a lot of Kansas City Chief fans on here. I'm like, oh, oh God. God. <laughs> Look at all these Kansas City Chief fans on my street. Yeah. <laughs> hard, hard being a Bills fan with uh, uh, how good they are right now. Yeah. Anyway. 
That's good. All right. Um, anything you want to wrap up with? I think you dropped a lot of like really interesting nuggets, but do you have any sort of closing thoughts before I let you go? I'm just excited. I'm excited about the times we're living. I know some people get like, they're, oh, it's a horrible time to be alive. All this negative stuff. I mean, look, you can focus on whatever you want to focus on. I choose to, I, the one thing, here's what one of my, my dad taught me. My dad was one of the happiest people I've ever met. Happiest people. And he had this little cube. We had this little cube on our um, coffee table and it was six sided and it would say, it had really cool sayings on it. And one of them said, uh, you see the opportunity in the problem you have today is one of the sides. And each mm. side has something really cool. Like one side had, um, had work ethic and freedom like together. So yeah. when I was watching TV, this thing will be staring at me the whole time. Right. So it, it, one of the things they train me to do is whenever I see a problem, what is the opportunity for that problem? Cause all that is, is a muscle that you can work on versus if you have a problem, most people get debilitated by it. Oh, well, they become a victim to the problem mm -hmm. versus a challenge and a game to overcome it. And so I'm excited. What I see is positivity. I see excitement. I see great things happening. Just got to look for the positivity in things. And if you see, if you look for it, you will find it. So I challenge everyone. Look, when you wake up tomorrow, when you go to bed tonight, Look for the positivity. Be grateful for what you got. Look for the positivity. I promise you, you will find it. I promise you. I can't imagine a more eloquent way to wrap up this episode. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And uh, thank you so much for coming on, Franco. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure, Parker. You're awesome. Hey everyone, that's all for today's show. I want to thank you so much for stopping by and watching, especially if you've made it all the way to this point. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes are going to be released, feel free to subscribe and make sure you hit the bell button as well. To learn more about today's guest, feel free to look in the description. You can also visit the podcast website, which is exploringhealthpodcast.com. That website will also be linked in the description. As always, likes, shares, comments are a huge help to me and to this channel and to the show. So any of that you can do, I would really appreciate. And again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.